It does not know what the cold open will be. It stares blankly at his camera, wondering how we will begin the show. Is that it? Welcome back to Keith and Mike Watch Deep Space Nine. Uh, the most accurate review of our show I think I have ever heard. Is that it? Mm. How's it going, Mike? It's going pretty good. I uh, Looking forward to chatting about this one, Keith. It's nice to be back on our normal cadence. It was mm. nice to watch with the fans last night. Fans of Deep Space Nine, I should say. <laughs> Not necessarily us. <laughs> no, 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 uh, no. Especially since one of our patrons, Samir, this is, I think he said his favorite or second favorite episode of Deep Space Nine. And so, really? Yeah, Interesting. So you requested a special time on Tuesday night. I made it so. We had a good group of folks. We had our newest our newest patron was there as well. It was Amazing. It's just a great little family affair. So thanks to everyone who joined us. We will be back to Tuesday nights unless Monday nights were better for you. Let me know. But Keith... We're here. Yeah. And we're ready. I'm excited. Yeah. I mean, I I did not watch. I did not have time to watch the watch along. So I have no idea what you thought about this episode. Uh, so it will be very interesting to discuss. Now, a lot has happened in the in the, the week since we last dropped an episode, including I saw you do Forever yes. Plaid at the Ambler Theater in or whatever the hell theater it is in Ambler, Pennsylvania. That about, uh, that about describes the level of professional we were at. <laughs> I'm telling you what, the show was fantastic. Uh, you were fantastic in it. The direction was so smooth, so clear, so tight. Uh, Jillian and I went down and we had a lovely lunch afterwards. Yeah, and it was, was great. A, uh, it was a really good time and a really good uh, production. So congratulations Thank to you, Mike. Sir. I Thank can't you. wait to uh, get back to old man salt and pepper Mike or just salt and salt oh, okay. Mike. A couple, more, a couple more weeks. I think I have a thought. My thought mm. is, and I haven't committed to it yet, is um, I have a thing on Saturday that I want to kind of look young for, mm -hmm. and then I'm considering, because we're going Don't into a, it. I'm considering a buzz cut down to the nubbins and to grow it back in white, you know, my normal natural. Oh, okay. So that you don't, so you don't have a bad ombre? Yes. Or like, you get you know, a totally like, bad ombre. A half and half, you know, a half and half. He's all on the top. Young and the uh, you know, you know, the opposite of that. You know, my brain's not good. No. Oh, that's uh, tomorrow, right? That debate tomorrow? That debate oh, of just two old guys? Whew. Uh, One you know, that it's, wants to, like, you know, rule the world. It's not like the future of our entire society is, uh, you know. I'm going to a baseball on. game. <laughs> I, here's the thing. Like, I, you know, obviously I'm a politics nerd. I've been, I've been like, caring about this stuff since, like, Dukakis era, mm -hmm. right? And every single debate I've ever gone to, or gone to, have, have watched, I, I get so excited for it. It's like a Super Bowl. Like, I'm ready. I'm like, I'm fired up. I remember, I think the, uh, I think the first debate I listened to was Bush Dukakis on the radio. Anyway, the point is, um, this is the first one where I'm genuinely, like, nervous and I'm not nervous about like how it goes and like whatever I'm just like I'm scared for like the world and I'm like so uh this will be the first one I don't watch like a sports game and I watch more like I'm terrified anyway on that beautiful thought <laughs> let us uh talk about last week's episode Rapture and uh bring in the opinions the thoughts and feelings I've been thinking Keith papers. before mm -hmm. we do this segment Okay. Probably best to revisit since it always feels like it's been six years since we talked to each other. What yes. our general thoughts were, just the scores of what we gave it before you dive in. Oh, okay. The scores, uh, I gave it an 84 mm -hmm. and you gave it an 81. This okay. was Cisco having vision. This is Joseph and the amazing Technicolor yes. Cisco. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, yeah, with the, and the, the Bajor not joining the Federation. Correct. So, yes. Kind of, uh, kind of big stuff there. So here is what y'all said. First of all, normally the rules are, I don't read it unless you're a patron. Mm -hmm. Except if you say something like this, Mally Rabbit said, y'all are great podcasters. I listen while at work. 
just telling you how great you guys are. Uh, that made my day. It really did. Thank so the you, new Mally. rule is, page, okay, first of all, take your squeaky pen and throw it across the room. <laughs> Number two, <laughs> you gotta be a patron. You gotta give us a super tip or just compliment us at the top of it. Just say nice things. But Our wait, hold on. Did you read so... the whole comment or just the compliment? If it's free. No, that was the whole comment. Oh, okay. But I mean, as far as moving forward, if you're a freebie and you give a compliment followed by a critique, what what then? Just well, then forget it. For I only take unadulterated <laughs> praise. Okay, cool. That's the. I just want to establish the guidelines. <laughs> anyway, thank you for listening. Uh, hope work is going well today. Yeah. Uh, I, I I don't know what you do, but hopefully uh, it's t today's a a, a good one. Chances are it's at least ten percent sucky. Oh, I mean, all work is. That's what I'm saying. That's why I think yeah. it's fair to say 10%. If only 10%. That's great. That's great. Anyway, uh, Joshua Cronin says, Glad you guys realized I'd never be pissed as you guys at you guys for saying the wrong name. I just never noticed a slip before, and this was like five times in a row. <laughs> Love you guys. I do enjoy these uniforms a lot, the new uniforms we switched over. Yeah. Uh, but still like the ones they start with better, because I like the color on the shoulders and it looks brighter. Let me say though, to Keith's point, this week is an unadulterated, egregious disaster for Cisco's comp badge. Oh, it's a mess. It's, it's all over the place. Disaster. It's all over it's the place. Frame to frame, in fact. Yeah. Above the yeah, black. It's above the black. Above it's the very black. migratory. Yeah. It's uh it's gonna be fixed. This is the last of the uh the Nobody's Cisco on that? Disaster. There's nobody watching. There, I mean there clearly is because they've Everybody else has it in the right place, and they know that they screwed up the uniform. I think it was literally, they just didn't have time to build him one that wasn't screwed up. Mm. And I think they were, they put it in the wrong place because it would have looked super weird to have it much lower, but then it's, it's a mess. It's a mess. It's crazy for a show with this amount of budget and this amount of scrutiny to like have that so messed up, but whatever it happened uh anyway joshua continues this episode is good to me uh i love more of the world building of cisco accepting his role as emissary and his love of bajor this episode itself is part two of a special storytelling arc i think almost part three uh 82 self-sealing stem bolts for me youtube viewer says tellarites and endorians are founding members of the federations but i don't know uh, but we hardly ever see them. They talk about them off camera, Tellarites and Andorians. <clears throat> excuse me. But we seem to have a guest Bolian in every episode. Male Bolians only, never female. Bolian prosthetics must be easily reusable. Yeah, they, they, I think because they're, the prosthetics are very, very minimal. You're just sort of painting folks blue. Yeah. Uh, but it gives Mike his favorite. Hey. Okay. His, his never favorite. Met a, never met a Bolian I ha didn't enjoy. Never met a bully and I didn't like Will Rogers Follies fans out there if you don't if you're not <laughs> deep cut deep cut <laughs> really didn't see us going down that avenue today uh, you know what you know Will Rogers Follies have to say mm -hmm. it's quite a joy it was fun I here's the thing the reason it takes up such a large part of my subconscious is when I was doing theater camp mm -hmm. back in high school like 95 96 it took place at a uh, sort of like a, a little summer stock equity theater. And the camp happened, we did our shows on the Saturday mornings or whatever, but the, the equity playhouse was running that whole time. And so we were allowed to go and see the show if mm. they had open tickets every night. And so Will Rogers was on and we were like 16, like, okay, I'll just go see it every night. So I think I watched that production of Will Rogers Follies like 14 times. I remember um, I was like 16, 17, 18, somewhere in there. Hmm. And I was already kind of like a theater nerd. I had done my first show and I was kind of had the bug or whatnot. But my, one of my buddies, Brad, his first big equity gig was the first or 12th national tour of Will Rogers Follies, that, that revival that had happened. And uh, it was so, you know, like that's the next kind of glass ceiling to break is when you see one of your friends doing it legit right. and you're like oh right. this is an achievable thing so that i remember and huge ensemble a lot of roles good yeah. thing for a camp because there's a lot of a lot of roles mm -hmm. i mean we didn't do it we just watched them do it 
Probably it, it better was, for everyone that you didn't do it. <laughs> oh my god, no. Well, hey, look, I, I was at that point doing a uh, Jafar mm. in an unlicensed mm -hmm. rogue production of Aladdin. You know, some would say that Will Rogers was the Ben Sisko of his day. See what I did there? I got us back to the show. Oh, thank did. you. Thank you. I, I mean, it doesn't make any sense, but thank you for getting us back online here. <laughs> Speaking of bad brain, JD says, Rog and Nog is fine too. <laughs> uh, which I, I don't listen to our episodes, but I was on the train and I listened to the first 10 minutes of last episode. And when you were making fun of me for messing up the names and then said Rog and Nog. I literally like did a spit take yeah, on the train. Mm -hmm. uh, JD continues, Keith, do you have a Trek cat cup? Hell yeah, I do. do yeah. And you want to know who gave me <coughs> the Chancellor. this Trek cat? Yeah. The Chancellor. <laughs> Chancellor Jen decked me out in Trek cat memorabilia. Uh, so that's how we work. Also talking about our friendship, brand loyalty is a great answer. <laughs> You're actually off slightly on first contact in terms of the timeline, uh, it doesn't take place till after next week's Deep Space Nine episode. In the episode Purgatory's Light in a few weeks, mm. Cisco does mention the recent Borg incursion. Interesting. Okay. The rumor has been that there was a communication mix up between the movie costume department and the show costume department. Oh, well, maybe that's why Worf didn't mention it. So when this episode comes out, it was at the point in my teenage years where I was very religiously indoctrinated and this episode hit really different then. Now I see it very, I'd be curious how how it hit you differently. I mean, I can imagine, but like exact, like in what way was, if you were super religious at the time seeing this episode, did it ring more true or more false? Interesting. Uh, and he says, uh, this is, <laughs> ha. You know, you always give me uh, crap for saying interesting a lot. JD, this is your next sentence. This is such an interesting one. Complicated, going 86 self-sealing stem bolts. Harry Pothead says, I love this episode. The horrible acting of the Admiral aside, it's great to see Avery Brooks go crazy, obviously. And it turns out this is an important episode. Also points out that Pat Robertson ran for president. So did Al Sharpton and so did Jesse Jackson. Uh, I think we were talking about religious figures uh, okay. mixing up with <clears throat> politics. And uh, he says people should have paid more attention to the last one. He is a good guy, Jesse Jackson. I, I remember Jesse Jackson running for president. I was, was this 92 he was running or was it 88? I, I, I do remember because I know my father was a fan. I wasn't old enough to vote at that point. But my father was like 100% on board with Jesse Jackson. Uh, Kevin Miles says. 84. 84? Mm -hmm. Did he run after that? Uh, 84 is the only one popping up. Uh, Jesse Jackson, 88. 88. 84, 88. 84, I was a little young for... Those are the two. He did both. ...clocking mm -hmm. who was running for president. But uh, my first, the first ever vote I cast was the third grade presidential election, which, uh, not surprisingly, in Honor Hill, Vermont, uh, Michael Dukakis did, did win. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, not so much in real life. Anyway, uh, Kevin Miles says, it is hard which, commenting. Which, hold, just, wh sorry, this is weird. I'm sorry I have to do this. Uh, which Star Trek character has Dukakis's? You mean dual caucuses? Mm -hmm. Th that's the Klingons. Great. Klingons. Klingons. That's Worf. Yeah. Worf's yeah. rocking a Dukak, too. There it is. There it is. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, he doesn't have one Willie Horton. He has two Willies. Mm -hmm. wow. We'll see ourselves out. Go ahead and click those. Super, super deep cut. We've got the uh, chapters below. <laughs> That's right. I can see our subscribers. <laughs> dick, 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 dick. <laughs> anyway, for the fourth time, Kevin Miles says it is hard commenting on this episode <laughs> without giving anything away. When Cisco was given command of the Deep Space Nine, Captain Picard stated it was his duty to prepare Bajor for admittance into the Federation. After that, he was free to move on. Therefore, you knew that Bajor was not going to become a member in this episode. Although, being free to move on and will move on are two different things. Uh, Kevin continues, I hope when your reviews of the entire show is over, you have a few wrap-up shows going back and having Mike rescore some of the episodes after he knows the whole story. Oh, That's Keith an and I... Idea. 
love a wrap up show. We we will. I mean, our wrap up show for this is going to be ridiculous. Can it top a three hour musical with tears and a beard and dressed as Gomez Adams? I mean, the bar is high. The bar is high. <laughs> probably. I give this episode ninety four self ceiling stumbles. And Kevin also pointed out this is this is I have not proposed this to you, but but Kevin was talking about uh, getting in contact and chatting with us, and I'm wondering. Maybe as a patron thing, someday we should do a live but pop Zoom the cameras on, yeah, where we can actually talk to everybody, mm-hmm. and like have and have like a little town meeting. That might be fun. A town hall, first the first the first ever town hall. Yeah, and like you know, and like do it like on Zoom, so we can all literally talk to each other. I like and use someone else's infrastructure. It might be fun. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anyway, Hibernation Pod says, for what it's worth, <laughs> and it is, and as petty as it is. I never liked Cassidy because she reminded me of someone I seriously can't stand. Aside from that, it's the arc significance of the Locust vision that makes this one a fairly good episode. I can't wait for what's to come. 70 self-sealing stem bolts. That's an interesting question. Mike, have you ever had a character Mm. that you could not like because it was too similar to a person that you know? No, but the closest I feel is there is a. F- I have. I'll be very vague here. I have a friend who used to be married to another friend, and they split up because one of them was pretty terrible. Pretty terrible human, it turns out. Oh, I thought you were talking about us for a second. No, but I and mean, no. but said terrible person has gone on to be quite a prolific commercial actor mm-hmm. nationally, and mm-hmm. so there are many commercials that I'll be at a bar, I'll be somewhere, and like said person will appear on said commercial and I'll have to stop everything and be like, that person's a douchebag. <laughs> <laughs> can't like the product, can't like the commercial, a-hole. No, yeah, I don't think I have a, a, a fictional character that way, but there are certainly actors mm-hmm. who are like, I just personally know and and do not care for. Uh, yes, that's, that's shocker why, for all you uh, people out there. A good portion of working actors are assholes. Some of them. I said a good them. portion. Yeah, all right, all right. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there, there's a reason I, I could not bring myself to go see the prom on Broadway. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though I have, I have friends, I had other friends who I like very much uh, mm-hmm. in that show. Anyway. Uh, they say don't set yourself up for failure, Keith. I don't know what that means. Oh, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, that means if you go and then you're gonna act and feel a way, and that's not worth doing, going through. I was just like, mm, I'll go see Bill, be more chill. That's that's sort of. I was like, ah, I really should go. I really should go. We Maybe really should get through this segment. This is this oh is my bad. god. It's all right. Well, worst. that's all right. So that's it. That's it. Let's talk about the episode. Yeah, sounds good. The darkness and the light. Deep Space Nine, season five, episode eleven, and it aired. Happy New Year, Mike. On January 6th, 1997, we have crossed crossed into 1997. But uh, don't worry, our top tune, still looking to unbreak that heart, Mike. Unbreak my heart, evil man unlock me again. But say really kind of interesting things. But say them like Vincent Price in Thriller. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I like it. The top movie, speaking of a horror thriller, was The Relic. Ooh. A, uh, a monster movie based on a book that I read. And I was like, oh, I think it was a Michael Crichton book? No, it wasn't a Michael I, I forget. Anyway, I read the book and uh, went to go see the movie. And I'm like, this had very little in relation to the, uh, to the movie. But... Douglas Preston. Douglas Preston. All right, whatever. But uh, speaking of um, synchronicity, as Mike would say, you know who starred in this movie? No. Linda Hunt and James oh. Whitmore. Man, they were riding that Linda Hunt train. Uh, I mean, both legends, legendary guest stars on The Practice from our other yeah, little podcast. Mike, what was on TV tonight? Keith, it was January, which means new shows abound, as you can mm-hmm. imagine. Oh, we're yeah, out of that sure. summer, so Dangerous Minds, which we mocked years ago, is still you're, on TV. You're obsessed with the show. Still ro- rocking ABC's big Monday night. Uh, 
some show was on CBS, followed by Murphy Brown, Sybil, Chicago Hope. Just great stuff happening over on CBS. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but what I want to mention from this uh, week, Keith, is a new show was airing on CBS. They were trying out a new comedy. Okay, it was okay. called Ink. Can Do you remember Ink? Do you remember who was in it? It was a vehicle for a real-life married couple. Oh, God. Somehow, it ran an entire season. They gave it a full order. 26 episodes but it was critically and uh the ratings were it was panned and so it did close but i guess it was self okay so here are your hints a husband wife couple okay who also one of them was from a popular cbs comedy and they were trying to like get the career going back again and they self-produced it which is why now i see why it got a full uh -huh. order I'm trying to think about, like, who was married, married at this point, like, Kira Sedgwick and Kevin Bacon? I mean, I'll give you I'll give you one more hint if you're ready. Yeah, yeah, okay. please. It was a, a former star of the beloved television show Cheers. They were trying to get another show back. Oh. Was a, Inc. Uh, oh, oh, was it Danny DeVito and... Uh... So this was Inc. was an American television sitcom that aired from CBS from October 21st, 96 to ni May 9th. 1997 starred real life husband and wife Ted Danson and Mary Steenbergen as divorced oh. newspaper journalists. Oh, wow. Yep. Interesting. Ink. And folks out there who uh, hopefully Mike won't get this reference, but uh, those of us are Deep Space Nine fans really probably wish that this show had been successful. Hmm, interesting. It brings up, um, let me know if this podcast already exists, folks, because I'm interested in it. I would love a podcast that d does a deep dive on, like, one-off pilots or series that only ran one season or, like, short things, because I I'm fascinated by that, the by these dead television shows. I, I think it would be interesting. I think it would have an audience of zero, but I well, do I do think it would be sort of our brand, isn't it? I'm I sure mean, that ex podcast exists. So we have not... an audience of tens, sir. Actually, we came out that because I'm about to pat ourselves and our family on the back in, in just a few moments. So. Okay. Well, I don't know what that means, but here we are. Uh, what was Voyager doing? Uh, the episode Fair Trade, in which Neelix looks for a map. Ah, that's exciting. The weekly world news headline, folks. We got a lot of feelings about astronaut P. Hmm. It's a hoax. Yeah. 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 And. Uh, China's Just, top root beer salesman hates this stuff. This was an article. <laughs> hey, that's Worf, baby. No, Worf likes it, right? Uh, no, Worf likes prune juice. Oh, right. Who? What's the root beer reference? Oh, that's Nog, right? That's that's Nog and all the Starfleet cadets Rog and Nog. Like root beer. Rog and Nog. Rog and Nog. Hmm. Oh my goodness. All Keith, right. Real quick. So, real last thing, because some Samir quick. Samir brought up Voyager, the Voyager podcast again. Yeah. I can never get the read. Did you like Voyager? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I, oh, I definitely, I, I like Voyager. I, Voyager, much like uh, a lot of the, I mean, sort of all of the '90s era Trek, struggled a little bit at the beginning, mm -hmm. and then really once it like got its traction, became quite good. Okay. And I think that there are, I think maybe the highs aren't quite as high as the Deep Space Nine highs, mm -hmm. but there's a re there's a lot there to like. And I and I think that some of the characters are really really good. They're, Voyager's just more inconsistent with the characters, right? Okay. Where Deep Space Nine, kind of everybody is interesting, and all the characters are are interesting and, and important to the plot. And with Voyager, there are just some that are just like, why are you here? Mm. And so when you hit on an episode on one of the why are you here characters, it's a little harder to get through. Okay. It's right. like, um, however, there's some really cool stuff in there. There's some really cool character development. Um, there's some really exciting stuff. Um, what they're able to sort of accomplish cinematically is pretty cool. And at end, it finishes really strong. So I think that, you know, it's really exciting to me when a series finishes strong. Mm -hmm. I care more about that than it's starting strong. Right. So if you have a really kick-ass finale, I'm like, all right, great. So... There you go. Well, uh, luckily, Mike won't remember any of that. Nope. So, uh... Now keep waste your nope. time no? With That's right. Trivia. I'm going to work it in. I'm going to be professional. Some of our trivial trivia include the director of this episode. 
Michael Vehar, who this is the first of seven episodes of Deep Space Nine. He did one episode of Next Generation, but will go on to do 13 of Voyager moving forward. This episode was written with a teleplay by Ronald D. Moore and a story by uh, by a fellow by the name of Brian Fuller, who uh, you uh, Star Trek fans might know, uh, the creator of Disco, mm. and uh, and is one of the one of the big kids in contemporary Trek. Universally loved Star Trek series Disco. Yes, yes, it, it, Discovery. It, 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 all this, all the the in dialogue. You know the upstage, downstage, mm-hmm. disco, Discovery. I'm just saying, everybody yeah. loves it, right? Everybody loves disco. Yes, it. There's no. It's not divisive <sighs> at all. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I am, I am, pushing my way through season four. Like I'm gonna finish it. I'm gonna do it. I have to do it. I'm doing it. Uh, Brian Fuller also created fantastic series Hannibal. Mm. Pushing Daisies mm-hmm. and the criminally underrated Manny Patinkin vehicle, Dead Like Me. Do you, you ever see Dead Like Me? I haven't, but I love everything Mandy does. So, there you uh, go. The, yeah, this was a. It was like a Showtime. It only lasted like two seasons, but they did do a movie. I think it was Ellen Muth and M- Manny Patinkin about Reapers. Mm. So in the pilot, this like this girl gets killed, and then she gets pulled in to become a, a, a like a Reaper. To help people transition out of death, so she would like goes and like pulls the drama their soul or a out of their or like a comedy vehicle. It's sort of like a dramedy. It's sort of a comedy, but like you know, it's 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 a little complex. But like, if you're about to be hit by a bus, she would come and like pull your soul out of your body before you get squished, and then like talk to you and help you through the, through the transition. Well, it's very first scene of Beetlejuice. Totally, yeah. Anyway, I love that show. It was really good. So. Uh, Brian is, Fuller. Did is it have a satisfying ending? Uh, or is it like one of those canceled and cut off at the knees? Sort of halfway. Okay. Because it was canceled and cut off at the knees, which was so annoying. But I think they did get a movie wrap up, okay. um, which helped a little bit, if I remember. But it was like years later, so everybody looks different. Anyway, uh, trivial trivia. We're finally here. So Randy Oglesby, who plays Solarin Prin in this episode. I was going to like tease Mike by trying to make him guess who he previously played. He's never going to remember. He previously played two characters in the same episode on Deep Space Nine. He played the Miradorn twins in the episode Vortex. Hmm. Then we'll go on to play Degra in several episodes of Star Trek Enterprise, which we will be getting to in 2029. So uh, Salirin's facial disfigurement was inspired by Christopher Tucker's makeup effect for the title character in a famous musical, Mike. Can you guess what that would be? No. A musical with a main character with oh, a facial disfiguration? Yes. I, I I teased it in the show. I said, sing for me! Yes, the Phantom of the Opera, of course. Also, for this episode, Ronald D. Moore considered Kira's terrorist past and the series' depiction of it, commenting... I really wanted to push that one. The idea was at that point that Kira had this backstory that she was a terrorist, which was mostly just something she said. Like, oh yeah, I used to be a terrorist, didn't have any real meaning to it. And I wanted to lean into that a bit. A terrorist is what? What do they actually do? What are some of the horrible things that she did? Rick Berman, on the other hand, was wary. Moore commented, there was definitely some reluctance. Rick would get a little leery when you start making the characters look less than ideal, especially after Gene passed away. He would ask, would Gene approve? He also didn't want them to be gay, but whatever. Uh, The Hollywood Reporter ran a retrospective on this episode in 2022, and they named the episode as one of DS9's best outings. The author wrote, It's Star Trek's disturbing take on Agatha Christie's And Then There Were None, a gripping thriller that pits two murderers and war criminals against each other, with each believing that they are the heroes in a story that has none, only casualties. Uh, Interesting, interesting take. All right, so our guest star... Oh, wait, no, not time for our guest stars. It's time for our always stars, our patrons, Mike. Oh, my God, Keith, so well done. You know, there was a time when we had to use big font uh, because there were so few. And now, there Keith, was a time. 
I used every font was 72. I know that we're a little fish in a big sea on YouTube here, but it it absolutely warms my heart that there are so many names on this on this slide. And uh, I just am just humbled by it. Brian Kimball, Beersock, Jason Moe, Peter Bank, Frank Rinch, Quarks Barr, Joshua Cronin, Ryan Chesley, Merit Neath, Merit Neath, Andrew Hayes, Alan, and the mysterious Horse Big Old Boot Shifts, Charles Babbage, Harry Pothead, Alan. Hey, Again. what's up, Alan? How many, so many Allens, you know? I think it's the same Alan, but Alan, uh, you know, two Anto- for the price of one today. Anton Thies, Carl Fisher, CRM Productions, Nicolay, Delusions, YouTube, Hubbard, <laughs> YouTube viewer. He had a funny comment recently. I, I'm trying to remember. Uh, he was angry. Uh, James, <laughs> they were angry, I should say. Uh, James Hubbard, Hibernation Pod. Miri, They're always angry at me for something. Welcome, Miri. How are you? Thanks for jumping into the, uh, the, the watch along last night. Uh, which you can do too by just being a patron at any yes. level. JD makes Colin, Chris Mitchell, Pat, Joshua. Chris Mitchell, by the way, your new, some of his new figures. I don't know if you if anybody follows him on Instagram, but holy crap! Uh, Pat, Joshua Cronin, A, welcome to the pod. Yes. Jerry, JD, Lutz, Wyatt, Andreas, welcome to the pod. Everybody, welcome to the pod. Of course, Chancellor Jen, she gives us your hot cat content, keeping it going. We are eternal grateful. You can do all kinds of stuff, including coming to the first ever town hall that Keith just pitched. Yeah. And you can get all of that and more. Patreon.com slash K and M one word. Ooh. Ooh. How, how, are we, how, how are we gonna we should have Jen moderate? One hundred percent. Yeah. You know like, what Jen and I, like, CEO Jen and I have been doing a little behind the scenes, Keith. What's old is new again. There is a, do you know what's come back? Inside of Fortnite, okay, which is like a thing the kids play, it's a video game. Oh, the vi- okay, yes. Inside I, I of that, like inside the last well, two weeks. Inside of that game, there's like other games now, which is a thing. Okay. One of them is a new rock band. So Jen and I have like unearthed an old rock band guitar, and we also got an old an old copy of Rock Band Four on PlayStation, and we've been rocking the rock band again, which is awesome. Okay. We're also getting a dog out there, so like we needed, we're just coming up with things that'll help us get through the hours and hours of time. We'll just be awake all of the time now. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, but it, you get it. Do you have it yet? Because you you told us about it. Yeah, we, we the pickup date is July eighth. So that so that first week of July, that second or that second week of July on the episode, you'll be uh, you'll hear it. <laughs> I'm sure. So yeah, uh, that's that's great. You know, you, you know, you know, what you need in a in a in a two bedroom apartment. <laughs> And you already have three cats and a puppy. That'll be. Yeah, the puppy will be, be great. We won't see the cats anymore. That's the best part. <laughs> They'll be under the bed for a year. Great. Everyone sounds happy. Yeah. All right. Uh, speaking of happy, let's introduce our guest stars. Of course, the aforementioned Randy Oglesby as Saran Prin, William Luckling as Pharrell, Diane Salinger as Lupaza, Jennifer Savage as Trenton Fala. And Aaron Eisenberg is here as Nog. What do you say we go into the screening room, Mike? The one Nog. I love when Aaron comes in for one scene. And it was a good scene. Yeah. Gone. Oh, no. That was a terrible, terrible joke. Just did it backwards. Rock. Mark. devolve into warming up <laughs> yeah. when in doubt <laughs> when in doubt warm up all right the darkness and the light in our teaser vedic discount keith carradine <laughs> speaking of uh <laughs> speaking of will rogers follies uh, he is leading some other vedics in a religious ceremony on bajor there are some pretty cool carved pillars that would look great in the imaginary barn I own in my head. They light a torch and we get a cool crane shot uh, going up above them. But then, because you know something's gonna happen, mm-hmm. something shoots out of it and kills Caradine. Also okay. known as Jen's biggest fear of having a solo stove out on our little deck. Getting zapped by a- uh, Yeah, just like, you know, fire assassin. Hazard. It's the, that, that torch is just too big for that room, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. Well, yours is not. I I got one of those. Yeah, I got great. roughly the equivalent yeah. for the for the back patio. Love this whole Very stuff. nice. So uh, back on Deep Space Nine, Bashir and Kira complain about the herbs she's supposed to be eating for her pregnancy when Odo comes in with some bad news. 
The Vedic who was killed was a member of the Shakar resistance cell with Kira. And we learned that he had a violent past. And Odo says the violence of his past has finally caught up with him. If you're wondering what the thesis statement of the episode is, and the cease and desist from Nana <laughs> on any more screenshots. I love when we find them. You get, it's hard oh. to make her make, uh, look unattractive. Man, we got a lot of good ones from the practice mm -hmm. back in the day. So, uh, anyway, so, uh-oh. Keiko returns home, where she is still staying with the O'Briens, but we see no sign Not of Keiko. Keiko or Molly, although we do find out that, you know, they, they got written off in a line there back on Bajor, but, mm -hmm. like, the home has no... I feel like the minute they left, she's, like, throwing everything that looks like them in the closet. I still don't... Okay. I, I, yeah, I get it. I, I, it's weird, but... So, like, even when they're not there... Like, the whole point is, like, she's spending time with him, right? So, like, while they're not... If they're away for a few weeks, why don't you just, like, hang out at her house? Well, O'Brien's there. Mm, and, you know, by this point, they're definitely banging. Yeah, right? Wasn't the whole point where they didn't want to be alone together because of the uh, hot, hot, steamy chemistry? I mean, that's... I guess that's true. Yeah. Oh, well. And like she didn't, and, and this isn't like, oh, I've moved to Detroit for a couple of months where mm -hmm. it's difficult. You just go across the hallway to yeah. your actual quarters. Also, you know what? I actually, I can fi I can fill that wormhole, Keith. Okay, it's, fill the wormhole. It's difficult to bang on a half twin bed, as we can see here. <laughs> yes, on Star Trek, they basically just have chastity beds. Yeah, it's like, do we have to? the the weird The only thing about the f future that I don't like is that you have to seat belt me into my bed. So I, don't I mean, fall like, out. do they all go to like Liberty University? <laughs> <laughs> you literally can't bang. You think on this it was bed. a California king for everyone, but no. I mean, although to be fair, uh, uh, it, it, I only had a twin in college, and it got used. I slept so. on a futon until I was thirty-five. That is true. That is a hashtag true fact. No wonder you don't have kids. <laughs> I do have Just a couple bad. broken futons, though. <laughs> I think futons are broken in general. They're the least <laughs> that, comfortable. That's sort of their functional purpose. They suck as a couch. They suck as a bed. There's no part of a futon that isn't trash. But well, Mike is like, I want, the, I, I, I want to live the futon lifestyle. I had a nice one. There's no such thing as a nice futon. I had a futon I freaking loved. They're terrible. They're garbage. Okay. Well, very, futon very, industry he's is very passionate. He's very passionate about that, but let's, let's move uh, on. Big feelings. Anyway, uh, then she gets a message. And it says in a digital voice, that's one. Which, uh, you know, that's Chekhov's one. You know there's going to be a two. You know who it sounded like, Keith? I what? am dude. <laughs> That's one. <laughs> what if it was just like a Muppet voice? That's one death. That's one terrorist I've ruined. I blew up a terrorist. That's three. Yeah, okay. This is serious, okay? <laughs> hey, Hulk, Kermit the Frog. Just wanted to let you know that I, I just <coughs> killed another one of your old friends. Hey, Bert. Hey, Bert. I don't know why you just killed another one of my old friends. All right. <laughs> We should just we should stop. We should just end the whole show now. That's terrible. Uh, I'm gonna leave it. I'll leave uh, it. Luckily, they're all like you know references from the '80s. Like I I can't I don't have a Peppa Pig or something. I can... Why are there so many songs about indiscriminate murder? <laughs> <laughs> and all of the innocent victims. <laughs> What is collateral? When does it matter? Okay. I'm sorry I exploded your maid. <laughs> this is serious. Oh, God. Uh, all right. Uh, D is for terrorist. Got enough for me. All right. Okay. Whew. All right. This is serious. I, uh, yeah. No, we'll get there. Okay. You know, sometimes trauma just makes you laugh. You're right. Uh, so in Act One, Odo, Kira, and still wearing his jacked-up uniform, Cisco speculate. Now yeah, there it is. Above. 
Let's keep track as we go through. Okay. They speculate that someone is targeting old members of Kira's resistance cell, but she's the only one who got a message. Hmm. That's interesting. They're going to beef up security on all of the surviving members. Later, O'Brien comes up to check on Kira. He's concerned for her, and probably his baby as well. Mm -hmm. And she's annoyed to be still stuck on Deep Space Nine protecting the baby, rather than charging off to investigate. Which makes sense. And it's Odo, actually great plot safety, right? Because knowing what comes, right. no way, I mean, as good as she is, if she leaves the station, she's dead as hell, right? Right. As sophisticated as we find out the, the baddie is, so we had to protect her in some way that would be believable, and her still being pregnant achieves that. Yeah. Yeah, well, it allows us... And not only does it delay the inevitable, mm -hmm. right, because you want to get to that for the finale, but it also ups the stakes mm -hmm. on the decision that she makes. She's not just ri risking her own life to do this. And now, so let me I ask you come, uh, kind of a plot as a writer, right? Mm -hmm. At this point, in the sort of meta story here, the bad guy who is stalking them, do you think he knows that she's pregnant yet? That he's done his recon? Or do you think he discovers that le at the end? That's a good question. I think it's left open. I would say based on the sophistication of this guy, mm -hmm. he probably would know. So that's, okay. I thought the same thing, but I do have a caveat. Now I'll, I'll bring it up when we get there. Okay. Well, there we go. So Odo calls and says that Kira's got a call coming in, and whoever is using it is using a VPN to hide her location. Mike said the same joke. Yeah, because we're the same person. It's and true. now, wait, Cisco is now wearing the correct uniform. Yes. So this was clearly filmed later in the week, mm -hmm. where they'd finally fixed his uh, his uniform, or it's like pulled well, back. Well, because it goes crazily. back and forth a couple other times in the episode. Let me ask you, just as a, because I know on, on in film there's a dedicated script supervisor, and they're in charge of continuity. Does that exist on TV as well? I would imagine yeah. so. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe even more so. And so, like, and I've got to think they were like, I don't know what to do, just hope nobody notices. And it's because of the fit? It wasn't just a mistake? I think it was a mistake on, I think the, the one that they made that's jacked up, the gray just came down like four oh, inches too Oh, it's the low. costume. It's the costume that's the problem. Oh, it's not they, just a matter of they put the combat i get you now that makes so the, a lot of so sense so when we first saw the costume the like the the, the proportions were off gray was way too far down uh -huh. he did not have the red on the sleeves and so they just had a messed up uniform for him is and his I, v as deep as o'brien's it's not o'brien has a deeper v it, it has a zipper oh gotcha and so they can they can make it as deep as it, it depends on how sexy they want to be in mm -hmm. that particular mm -hmm. one o'brien obviously chooses sexy mm -hmm. uh because, you know, he's, he's, he's seducing Kira, so. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so the, the lady calling on the VPN it turns out to be another Resistance member who wants to talk to Kira privately. Her name is Fala, and she's terrified. Kira says she's sending Worf and Dax to pick her up and bring her to the station to be safe. I actually thought she was really, for, like, never actually getting to see her in person, I thought it was a really well a really well developed character right they made her even in her sort of exposition here where Kira explains who she is she sounds very like Julian Assange right like a really skilled back channel sort of hacker slash information feeder type of scenario well sort of except but I the part about that I liked about her was that she 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 was sort of doing the even more heroic thing Mm -hmm. Because she was feeding information, and she was, she was scared. Like yeah. she, she, you know, she she had to live, exist as Looking part of the shoulder. underground, in character, twenty four seven, risking her life face to face mm -hmm. with the people that she was reporting on. So she's like the people who owned the Anne Frank house. Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. And so she's she's right there. She's in it. She never got over her fear, but mm -hmm. she was still doing it. And so, which is why. She was never an official member, even after the occupation. She was still scared, like, I don't want to be associated with this. And so the, I think it makes her a little bit more heroic, even. It evokes that, you know that first scene in Inglorious Bastards? Yes. Where 
what's Christoph Waltz comes in and just like there's the tension of that. Imagine yeah. living that twenty four seven. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And there are plenty of people who did that in real life yeah. and are do it actively doing it right now. Uh, so uh, anyway, um, they send Worf and Dax to go pick her up, and on the runabout, Worf and Dax banter for a while. Dax bet two bars of latinum in a Tonga game against a world champion. Then Worf refuses to lend her the money. And she says she's going to Quark, uh, to which Worf responds, Quark may lend you the money, but remember, rule of acquisition number 111, <laughs> treat people in your debt like family. Exploit them. But that was a nice little detail there. Yeah, it although does... I, would, I would question whether... I would love to have been in that meeting, right, where they're like, yo, this is a dark episode. There was no darkness in the teaser. There's no levity. Any I mean, there's no levity in the teaser. There's no levity anywhere. Like, should we or should we not put in like an I love Lucy scene with Worf and Dax before we show a vaporized body or should we just like let the episode be what it is well I I think from a writing perspective like I you know I wouldn't go full comedy but like I don't think this was like slapstick or anything like that you want to we're, we're setting up the horror yeah, it does juxtapose well. I think and if you're so, riding one note the whole time, and then it, this does make it feel a little deeper. We than... want to, we want to, you know, the the horror is going to be more horrible if it's interrupting normal life mm -hmm. and happy life, and and if, and like it is like this is particularly shocking and horrible. What mm -hmm. what happens here? And so I didn't mind it at all. Uh, it did, however, and and I bet you somebody listening to this has an answer to this, and they probably addressed it in, in maybe the episode Dax or or another one. Uh, and I just forgot. But what's the deal with Trill inheritance law? Right? Because mm. you would imagine, because you know, the 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 joke here is that Dax doesn't have any money, right? So when the Trill dies, where does the money go? Obviously based on this, it seems like it doesn't follow the symbiont. Right? It would go to next of kin for the host. Because otherwise, all of the symbionts would be super rich, like vampires, right? Yeah. And they never really mention that when we hear, when we learn about the, like, because all of the cadets and people that are trying to be hosts, none of them seem to be in it about the money. Although, apparently, if you're going to get left... Well, I mean, we're obviously they're part of the Federation. The Federation yeah. doesn't do money, but like you know, come on, everyone does a little stuff, money. right? Well, like if I live for three hundred years, even as poor as I am, thanks to Mike talking me into using a high interest savings account, like I'm tens of dollars richer now. Maybe they should. Maybe it gets donated back to like the council or the Trill Society or something. Yeah, or or. I, I, it would make sense if it goes to the host's family as like a thank you for the host. Yeah, that's a good point. Making that sacrifice. I don't know, but they don't see it as a sacrifice. I don't know. Anyway. Well, this person is vaporized. Yes. So they begin the transport to take Fala, and it goes horribly wrong as Fala gets full on the motion pictured. Yeah, I was going to say, kudos for going there with the <clears throat> practical when, effect here. But yeah, I mean, and we actually like see the horrible goo body. Uh, also, you know, Samir brought this up, and I, 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 I don't know if I would have caught it otherwise. But this episode specifically is shot really interestingly. Like, kudos to the director and DP. Like, we see a lot of scale. We see a lot of depth of focus. We see a lot yeah. of. It feels, you know, for an episode that takes place entirely on the station, we never actually go to any of the spots. It except for the final. Well, the final. The it feels very epic, and I appreciate that. Yeah, well, and you know, and in a in an episode, of course, like the darkness and the light, right? Yeah. There's a lot of darkness and a lot of light. Oh yeah, that shadow sequence when we're in her quarters. Yeah, just it's very it's very dark. It's yeah, I, I thought that was very well directed. Uh, and there's a, a fantastic scene coming up, and I only have one note from the direction, but anyway, so we see the horrible goo body. Akira arrives with Cisco and Odo to investigate. The charred body they built is pretty horrifying. Mm -hmm. uh, very impressively horrifying. Odo confirms that, of course, this was another assassination. A tiny device that scrambles the transporter uh, they implanted under their skin. Uh, and whoever did this obviously is a remarkably sophisticated assassin. 
Kira, uh, or oh, I, I sort of mentioned it before, Kira says that Fala wasn't even an official member of the cell. She was undercover. And this also confirms that whatever, whoever is doing this has incre incredible intelligence gathering. Keith, as Cisco well. Badge Alert. Cisco Badge Alert. Oh, it's up. It's up. It's up. It's down. Whatever. So Kira says that I, I sort of undercut this beat already, but here's what Kira says about Fala. She says she was always so afraid, afraid that she'd be caught and executed, but she never stopped. I once told her I thought she was braver than the rest of us because she had to live with that fear every day. Even after the occupation was over, Fala never wanted anyone to know she was secretly helping us. She was worried that someone might come looking for her for revenge. And it turned out to be Prussian. Later, Kira walks through the promenade and hears, that's two being played over and over again, and it's playing off of a pad that Quark found, and it was coded for Kira, but of course, Quark stole it. Uh, so like, the, there's, there's a psychological thing that they're doing to Kira specifically as well here, which is very interesting. Odo speculates that this must be retaliation for an attack that Kira participated in directly. Then, someone starts hacking into the security database, and another picture is displayed with the message, That's three. We have another victim. Kira naturally is starting to lose her cool. So she heads back home, this time with armed security. And there's also a guard at the door to her quarters. She goes in and plans to lie down in her bedroom when she hears something goes... Awesome shot, by the way. This tracking shot... Once again, talking yeah. about scale and stuff looks awesome. I mean, God, that set is so Oof. good. It just Such adds a... so much, right? It's funny, so going back and watching some TNG, it's like, it's so, sta it feels so static compared to all of the curves and scale and, and kind of like uh, um, upshots and things we can do with like Zoom in this episode, in this show that we can't, we, they just don't do over there. Yeah, well, the... The, the Deep Space Nine set is both larger, right? Because the 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 ceiling heights, on, you know, obviously in the promenade, it's multiple stories. That's also true in Quark. Ops has a crazy high ceiling. So you you get sort of the epic scale of that where on, um, you know, on next gen, really only the engineering set has mm -hmm. that level of height and scale. But at the same time, the Deep Space Nine set is also much more claustrophobic. Yeah because it's darker and the hallways sort of curve in on you. And, but because you know, of those, because of the geometry and the lighting that is employed in this show, the thing we take for granted, we don't take for granted, but we don't talk about it enough, but it's not lost on us, is the time it must take for setups. The setups must yeah. be incredibly difficult, especially to maintain consistency with lighting and all that. And you know that's not to take into account makeup time and all that like the the production schedule is just so not long work. enough <laughs> for how they so did this. so much work yeah it's insane uh you know you know compared to shooting an episode of law and order you just turn the lights yep. on and walk down the streets like god everything here and this is also 1997 they i, I can't just yeah, it's not on your you're not filming I can't it on just this change the yeah. lights on my gobi uh -huh. app yep. and make that do whatever i wanted to instantly yep. like oh they had to swap out of the gels it's so Bring much the dollies fun. in and roll. I don't even know how. There's not a lot of handheld yeah. taking place, you know? Yeah, very impressive. So uh, Kira takes out a phaser. Uh, there's something has gone bump. And Act 3, she investigates and discovers that it's her friends Pharrell and Lupaza, who we met previously. Like, hold in on, the, look uh, at that shot. Look how perfectly yeah. lit that is. Perfectly. It's dark, but we're casting enough shadow on her face. We can see everything in the foreground. We can see the glimmer off her ears, but it's not glaring. I mean, it's so much. It's such so well done. Really well done. Uh, so we we did you remember Pharrell and, Lup and Lupaza in this? I, I from the J, Shikara JD episode? helped me out. Yeah. The Reclamators, uh, baby. So we're all yes, that's right. We're old buddies here, and they snuck in, knocked out the security guard, and uh, they got in to her quarters while they were doing all this security, so both, they're very impressive. Also, security, like, it's hard to, <laughs> Odo's like. The security is, gets called into question a lot in this episode, Clear, especially after this scene, where there's a, they, someone was able to like arrange a giant gaping explosion into one of the quarters of one of our main people. That's some bad news. 
Well, but that's clever because it came from the outside. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even from the inside. Two kudos here. One, that they gave this uh, random bodyguard enough lines that he wasn't just an under five. Like, he got the full guest rate on this, so good for him. Um, I doubt he was over five. He was. I counted his lines. There were more than five. Did you really? Yeah. Because I thought they were just going to... Because he's just like, thanks, Major. But then in this scene, he gets a bunch of lines. Um, So kudos to them for reaching into the pockets. And B... I thought for sure, since they were introducing these characters back and bringing them on, that they were this is the big switcheroo, Keith. We're about halfway here. I thought for sure we were about to discover one of them mm. was uh, a secret on a secret vendetta. Like I thought it was her for sure. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, I, couldn't, I, couldn't have been I, more I wrong. Did not think about that, but I I like it. That's interesting, especially since we've set her up before. Mm -hmm. But because uh, I was like, there's no way they're going to bring them on and then just kill them. Yeah, well, welcome to Deep Space Nine, yeah, buddy. Yeah, baby. So, uh, anyway, they, they're they old friends, and they've come to take care of whoever's doing this, i.e., we're going to go assassinate them. Kira says we need to leave this to the authorities, but they know Kira is going to want them to kill whoever is taking, who's doing this. And they give Kira more of the horrible herbs she's avoided taking, which is a funny beat, but also later... Mm -hmm some good sort of plot device here. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was really deftly well, it handled. Takes it, it takes it from the like the universe of Technobabble, like it just explained it away, to, oh no, we set these breadcrumbs up. They, they really did, and you, do, uh, you don't really see it coming. Because mm -hmm. um, you, you think it's, oh, it's just like a comedy interesting writing beat. because it doesn't matter how many great monologues Nana gives. It just doesn't matter. Because she's one of our main protagonists, we always give her the benefit of the doubt, right? We always take you, yeah. you, you get you rough the edges off. But having the characters come and just knowing her, and we believe that they're old friends, know that like, oh, her instinct's gonna be, we gotta go on a sleeper assassination mission, right? Yeah, like that's, how we, that's how we handle stuff. Yeah. Um, gives the context we need, which draws the, the questions that we're gonna wrestle with in this episode. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So uh, they agree to stay here in the O'Brien quarters to help guard. I guess Don't bother. Keiko's cool with it. Uh, Keiko's on Bajor. It's like, it's O'Brien who's like, why are there uh, these Mommy, people in my, house? my bed smells funny. Yeah. My bed smells like terrorist. So, uh, Odo and Cisco. Oh, oh yeah. So, O'Brien comes in. They almost shoot him, but, you know, it's all good. He's, he's cool, cool with it. So, Odo and Cisco later talk about the latest assassination. Cisco's migratory comm badge is back down to where it should be in the scene, and the assassin, we find out, is using microprobes to remotely implant bombs in people's bodies. Pretty scary stuff. Yeah. And like, you know, eventually, you know, drones are gonna get small enough, explosives are gonna get small enough, like this is coming. So on Ops, Nog, using his super Ferengi hearing, is able to help figure out that the digital voice announcing the deaths is actually Kira's. So the psychological torture continues. Then they get an alert. There's been an explosion in the O'Brien quarters. So she's the only one he's playing with his food with, right? We've established That's right. that? That's right. So that, that does, I would say that that gives points to the, I know she's pregnant, I can't just kill her, I've got to torture her vibes right i think so yeah and like he obviously specifically blames her mm -hmm. and and wants to torture her the most wish that was clearer in this well we'll get there i think so yeah i i agree so you know in the uh in the scene they found that there's been an explosion in the o'brien quarters i think nana's reaction is great in this because they announce what's happened she just freezes mm -hmm. she doesn't go Whoa! she just freezes and then they cut away, and then we come back, and she's gone. Which all of that feels correct character-wise. Uh, Dax confirms there's been a hull breach in the quarters, and Kira makes a run for her quarters and fights her way to the door uh, before collapsing. So she fights her way through all of the security. This feels like Kira, but then she collapses. Because we need a commercial break. Mm -hmm. And in Act 4, Kira wakes up in the infirmary. And Bashir is there and tells her that she suffered a placental laceration and a hemorrhage, but he has repaired the damage. So this also reinforces the physical stakes for her, mm -hmm. that she can't go out there and go into combat because, you know, there's literal, she could 
quite literally die and the baby. And it also what I love, because we come back to it, right? But, you know, she's all gung-ho here. We've established that, hey, if, if, if things were different, I'd be out there just murdering, right? I'd be like on a hunt. And, and yet they keep talking about this baby to reinforce that, you know, despite where she's come from, she does understand innocence, right? This baby, obviously, she is her instinct is to protect it. She's protecting it for right. herself and for the O'Briens. There is a definition of innocence there, which does it. It makes the juxtaposition all the more stark. Well, and and her, because a lot of this is about her decisions in the past, but her decisions right now, yeah, like her going off on this vendetta, on this revenge tour. I mean, there's a lot to think about her making that decision. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, we find out that Lupaza and Pharrell are dead. They were literally sucked out into space. Great uh, beat, like you just mentioned. She knows it too. We don't. She doesn't even need to hear the news. It's just he's not telling her. He's he's affirming for her. He's confirming, right? Uh, but we find out that O'Brien wasn't there, luckily. And we see Odo. See this shot, I. Awesome. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, we see Odo there standing over Kira as she does a monologue about growing up in the resistance. And this is new information to us. Um, and this is all one continuous shot. It's just pulling in from all the way out right into her face. Mm -hmm. And here's what she says. I was 13 when I joined the resistance. I'd been hanging around the Shakar base camp for a few weeks, running errands, cleaning weapons, that kind of a thing. And one night, they had an ambush planned, but they were a man short. I volunteered to go, but everyone said I was too young, too small. But Lupaza stuck up for me. She said I had the heart of a Sinoraptor, and it was time, and it was not, there was no time to be choosy. Pharrell made some joke, I don't remember what it was, but I remember Lupita hitting him, and uh, she always does that. They love each other that way, but it was up to Shakar. He stared at me for a long time before deciding that maybe I was big enough to carry a Pfizer rifle after all. So that night, we set up an ambush on the ridgeline and waited. I was so cold, my hands kept shaking. I was so afraid that the others would see me and think I was nervous that I kept biting my fingers to keep the blood flowing. There must We must have been out there for three, four hours before the skimmer appeared and sat down right where Pharrell said it would. And when the hatch opened, that first Cardassian stepped out, I just started firing. I didn't stop until I discharged the entire power cell. When it was over, I was so relieved that I didn't let anyone down, I was almost giddy. Pharrell kept telling me to stop grinning, and that it made me look even younger. But I couldn't help it. I was one of them. I was in the resistance. And Lupaza made this for me, her earring, out of some of the metal from that skimmer. So, uh... Bunch of thoughts on this because it's first off, thirteen, mm -hmm. right? Like we see TV thirteen and it's like eighteen. Mm -hmm. Thirteen in real life is so little, mm -hmm. is so small, and and I think it really like what that type of a thing must do to a thirteen-year-old brain in real life, a literal child soldier. Mm -hmm. Well, first I have to decide, always remind myself. My, my dad had his first kid when he was 15 years old, by the way. Um, yeah, oof. That's insane. Two, so yeah, yes, the youth of it, but also, once again, that idea of innocence, right? Like her innocence there is taken away. Yeah. Justified or not justified, right? Whatever, however you want to read the episode or read kind of just life and what, how, yeah. war and all of this. Because I'm, not, I don't have. A, I'm gonna be. I'll, I'll spoiler alert. I don't have a hard take on this. I, it's. I try. It's one of those things in life where it's like it. So many things can be true at the same time that it's. I yeah. don't. I can't come down on a side of the line. I can't. I just don't. Um, which is just life, right? Um, but you can say that she was. She her innocence was taken from her, and. Now you can assign the blame for that to the, the other resistance fighters or to the occupate the occupying Cardassians. You can that's that's a separate issue, right? But her innocence was taken away, and yeah. also a thirteen-year-old probably can't make that decision. As she said, what I think is really interestingly communicated there is that she started firing indiscriminately. She didn't think about like the point was any Cardassian what? equals bad Cardassian, and that was she was indoctrinated with that. True or true or good or bad, right? 
You know what I mean? That's and that's that we see that in these conflicts. I mean, and and it's like you you know we talk about consent, right? And and like you legally cannot even consent to sex before you're 18. This is five years before that. How was she able to have consent for taking a life, mm-hmm. right? And like it's and so. It and how much of her personality in, in the rest of her life and all of her ideals and all of her the her decisions and everything she did right. from that point forward are all based on that right so it, right. everything changes it, it, from it, that. it rewires your brain and like your and, and and as we know today your brain your decision making process in your brain is not finished cooking until you're 25 mm-hmm. not 18 not 13 25 I was I always think back when we these kind of conversations come up to the draft, right? And it's not just the American draft. So many other countries, it's the same same idea, right? Where it's like it's not yeah. a choice. Speaking of consent, the, yeah. you know, and and so you can see how impactful this was to her. We just sent people, fa- hundreds of thousands of people, millions of kids, yeah, to just do that. Yeah, hundred percent, absolutely. And like you know, like I said, we're sending eighteen year olds out to fight. Their brains aren't even fin- fully cooked yet. Yeah. And and so it also I think changes the context of. Shakar and and her two friends there who advocated for this child to be a part of this. But chances are they went through the same thing. I'm sure they did. I'm sure they did. And it's not so black and white either because like if if there were people if there were Nazis marching down the street here and I was with a teenager and I and like if you hand on the gun, you probably do. Well, you know, it Often in these types of like when you have to have a resistance to overcome a occupying force, your numbers are low, so you have yeah. to assemble. You, you said you know, you have. I mean, it's it is inherent with compromise. It is inherent with the lesser of two evils. And like, I I, I think I'm with you. Like, I don't really know yeah. I what love the right call is here. Renee's performance here too, because Odo clearly. And now we have that interesting context from some episodes ago where we were we were adjudicating his behavior and culpability under yep. dip, the uh, from the other side and all of that context isn't just in the script it's on his face yeah. it's on the way he just stands over her it's on under the, the way, mask it's on the way some of he's, which is on my bookshelf behind me yep he's on the way he's trying to help her in this investigation just just some master classes and performance yeah, taking place no it, and, and it's it's that really monologue, fascinating even Keith who actually did a pretty good read there you know Try to just in your daily life today. Try to say Rhino Raptor or whatever, Sino Raptor, and like right. sell it, right? Just just try to do it. And yet she does it with a tear and and does so much context and empathy and just oh goddamn. She's and dead. one single unbroken take. Now there, this is the part where I have a problem with the direction. They cut away for that reaction shot from Odo, and. I get it, and as you pointed out, Renee's performance is amazing, and storytelling-wise, mm-hmm. that's great. But I, I think it's fairly clear this was one single unbroken take, and I don't think they should have cut away from it. Well, they may have filmed three to four to six single unbroken takes and spliced a second one, and that might have been their splice, splice mark, would be my kind of guess. I don't think so, because I was watching it real carefully, like tier positioning, mm. and I would bet money they cut up the take. Interesting. Um, Love to know. And I, I, you know, and you know Nanak could pull it off. I'd rather that be a full take. Anyway, the performance is phenomenal. I think that, I think the writing of that monologue is, is terrific. Um, so anyway, so after that, Odo explains that they, uh, that her buddies were killed by another probe that shot out the window of the O'Brien quarters. So it never even got on the station. It shot out the window. And he says he has collected about 25 suspects from his sources in Cardassia, which he has called in a lot of favors in order to get. Uh, he uh, Kira asks to see it, and he demurs, knowing that she's going to run off and try to kill the assassin. But she says, no, no, I wouldn't do that. Odo leaves, and she does just that. No, 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 no. That's, that's the wrong read. She says, you're right, I absolutely would do that. It was her response to him. <sighs> yeah. And then she does, which is, brings me to my, it's the verging on my only wormhole. Mm. 
why did Odo not know she was going to do exactly this? Why wouldn't he have, like, VPN'd the list or sh somehow protected against it? It seems like such a gaffe on Odo's part, unless he's still just, like, he, she's his weakness, and so he got kryptonited a bit. Oof. It just seems well, like I, such I an oversight. A... Well, because have... the second they blew a hole in the station, I would have yep. this mf -er on lockdown alpha zero, right? Yeah. But instead, he doesn't hide his Odo. He hides the list behind Odo one, two, three, and she just goes in and takes it off his desk? I think there are three possible explanations. Hold on. Let, let me finish my oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're telling me the head of security on the station, the head of security on the station doesn't have a you can't beam in here lock? I a uh, transporter scrambler? I don't know. You know, I, you, I So anybody can just be like, like beep, 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 beam me into Odo's office? Well, but there are many situations where he needs to be able to beam in and out himself. Just seems an unforced error, baby. All right, so here's here's three possible explanations. Right. One, um, the fact you know the fact that she has the baby, obviously that's why she didn't before, right? And I think that it's um, you know, and if she didn't go out after the first two or the first three, why now, right? Okay, I think that's that's the sort of the, the one on the face. Option number two is what you pointed out that uh, Odo has a blind spot for Kira. Mm -hmm. And maybe he believes that she trusts him to do the investigation. Yeah, or and, and <gasps> just it doesn't think clearly when it happens, when it relates to Kira, um, which I think is also possible too. Option number three is he knew exactly what she was going to do and let her because he knew she needed to. Yep, yeah, okay. That's fair. So... I, I don't I don't know what of those is true. I think one of them probably is. This reminds me of the last thing, you know, as to our kind of decision about whether Silas knew that this is what that that she was pregnant. He must have known. Was was his intention in the blowing up of the O'Briens to kill just those two, or was he trying to get three for one? I don't know. I would imagine just those two. That seems to be like the point, but then how does he know where she's at at all times? Like he waited until she was gone to deploy the thing. This guy's so sophisticated. He might. I mean, he's he's got these micro probes. If he can implant a bomb, he can implant a bug. He's like low key the best bad guy we've had. He's certainly the most powerful. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and the and he's using Romulan tech, mm -hmm. which is like they're all about sneaking and yeah, spying and that's assassinating people. So. Uh, Anyway, so she staggers off the bed and beams herself into Odo's office, steals the data, and beams out again. His response, Odo, Odo's response to it, does does sort of refute your last argument. They did it on purpose? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he does seem genuinely concerned. Uh, he doesn't like never-ending story when the kid steals the book. Yes, 80s reference, come on! I know everyone here that knows that movie. That was well done. So, uh, Odo, uh, yeah, so Kira flies out in search of the killer, and she thinks she's got him. He lives on a remote planet outside of the DMZ. Uh, who we, we sort of cut through her, uh, taking people off of the list because we don't have time. So she goes into his house, which, like, cool practical mat thing that they built here. As like, his, like, remote. Give me the most bad guy Larry thing you can possibly come up with. That's right. Bad guy in a budget lair. Yeah. Uh, Before you even get to it, I'll, I want to say kudos to the Keith Varney family of all ilks because the sound design in this lair is awesome. The very base layer, you can hear like the wind howling, all kinds of cool stuff. Oh, uh, they they were on Voyager at this point. So, oh, well, whoever took over. No, nope, nobody I'm related to did the sound for this episode, sadly. By the way, Keith, check out the YouTube comments on the uh, interview with your brother. There's some questions there that need addressing. Oh, yeah, we have to set up another yeah. episode of that. I've, I already asked him. He's already on board, so we just need to do it. So, uh, anyway, so she goes into his house, which looks like a dark lab filled with weird exper equipment. She phasers a decoy hologram, clever, and the, uh, 
then she is phasered herself. That was quick. Mm -hmm. I wish we'd had a little bit more time that didn't allow her to get zapped immediately. I mean, the decoy is a smart idea. It's cool. Um, and I believe it wasn't him who phasered her. It was an automatic phasery kind of a deal. Um, but if if we had like 10 more minutes in this episode, I think it would have been great. We don't need a full two-parter, but like 10 more minutes. Um, but look, we got to do what we got to do. So she wakes up again. And this time she is force field strapped to a pretty comfy looking chair. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she was pregnant. So I mean, she used to be at this point. But anyway, uh, we hear a voice in the darkness monologuing, speaking like she's a test subject doing the serial killer thing. Very Silence of the Lambs. Very, well, very Silence of the Lambs, very 90s serial killer thriller. Mm -hmm. um, There's also and, an interesting effect shot here where she's sort of like scanned. And it, yep. the scan definitely goes over her belly. So it's once again, it's like there's a possibility that this is where he discovers she was pregnant. But I, <clears throat> I don't know. It doesn't really I, matter. I'm just. It, no, it doesn't. But I, I see I see why you'd wonder. Uh, and of course, he, he's talking like a serial killer who's gone mad, which is kind of the what he is at mm -hmm. this point. And in Act 5, it is clear that Kira's captor has gone insane. Uh, he is and he finally explains that he uh, has a vendetta against Kira because he was disfigured by an attack she carried out. So, you know, I know, you know when you said like, I wish we had had a little more time for that scene, why that scene's important is because I felt the jump in my first watch. Clearly, because she, she's referring to him by first name, right? From from the get of this scene, which clearly she knows because she, 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 she zeroed in on him. But right. we as the audience don't see her do that. And so it's like, oh wait, how she know this guy? Oh, she knew all along. Oh wait, like there's just a moment of like, that shortcut is felt and it does yeah. it does impact the resonance because it actually would have been awesome, I think, if they had discovered it back on the station. If her monologue had taken place in context to this guy and the experience and we could have seen what he went through from her viewpoint, I feel yeah. like it would have been it, it, it would have been, yeah, I mean, I, I think the rewrite on this would be that this first attack she did when she was 13 was this attack. Yeah. And so... And he's been plotting this shit his, her whole life, 30 years plus, you know what I mean? Right. Or whatever. Right. And like, something she did because she was 13, did the disfigurement, like, she, I don't know, something that she did was made it particularly worse. Ripple effect, right? Ripple effect. And... And that way, these these two things are, are tied together. Yeah, I think that I think that would be better. Now, of course, the point of this episode is that this was a lifestyle for her. Mm -hmm. She did this many hundreds of times, not just once. So it undercuts that a little bit. But I think it would have been a little bit more interesting to have that be tied to it. But again, if they had an hour and ten minutes and not forty-two minutes. I think this would have really benefited from that. It's kind of However, a movie. this feels like the plot of a movie. Very great, a good one too. Yeah, you know, well, but it's, it's Agatha Christie, and I think it would be. Um, but yeah, like a standalone Kira movie, this would be cool. Anyway, so they have this interaction, which I think is pretty interesting. Kira says, "So, you were wounded in an attack I carried out when I was in the Resistance, and I'm supposed to feel guilty." It was a war, Salarin. 15 million Bajorans died during the occupation. And you want me to feel sorry for you? And he says, no, I wasn't part of your war. I was an innocent. I wasn't even in the military. You know what I did on Bajor? I was a servant. I cleaned uniforms for Gul Perek. And Kira says, none of us liked killing, but we were fighting for our freedom against... You vaporized the entire east wing of the house. Twelve Cardassians were killed, including Gul Parak's entire family. Including children, I would assume. Twenty-three others were crippled. Don't you feel guilty? Don't you feel ashamed of what you did? And Kira says, none of you should have been on Bajor. It wasn't your world. For 50 years, you raped our planet and killed our people. You lived on our land, took the food from our mouths. So I don't care if you held a phaser in your hand or iron shirts for a living. You were all guilty and you were all legitimate 
targets. Oof. And Solaren says, and that's what makes you a murderer. Indiscriminate killing. No sense of morality. No thought given to the consequences of your action. That's what makes us different. I love... Not Mike agreeing. Yeah. I don't agree. I, I don't know if I agree. But I love that they have her double down because it's completely consistent. Yes. It's completely consistent and they could have waffled and they could have had it some, be some m morality sort of play. But they don't. And that's what makes the, the conversation interesting. It's the grace. It's the very thing that Berman was afraid of doing. Yeah. That makes this the best. Well, if you look from the lens of like, what are people going to like? Or what are it's people like, going to oh, think? Are we, are we risking the likability of our character by adding this gray area? You was it Norman have? Lear? Somebody was like, just make the show you want because they're going to cancel you anyway. That's right. <laughs> That's right. But it's like, it, the, it. we've already established that she did these things. It's sort of disingenuous not to really deal with the reality of that, reality of the consequences of that. Uh, so anyway, they continue. Because this this conversation, this, this dialogue happens, continues to double down on the reality of both of their positions and I, it's it's really good writing and Kira says I it, that's what it, you, you no thoughts of the consequences of reaction that's what makes us different Kira says I was a soldier you're just a bitter old man out for revenge and he says I am bringing the guilty to justice and unlike you I take care to protect the innocent I could have killed every monk in that cavern or everyone on that runabout, or half the population of Deep Space Nine, but I didn't. Only the guilty have died. And he's got a point. He does. I mean, I think I would argue, and she doesn't, but I would inject, and what kind of does neuter his point a little bit. It's not a fair, it's not like a debate where they're on equal footing. Because, well, I guess in some ways you could, whatever. The point is that he is taking justice into his own hands, right? So he is unilaterally deciding who lives or dies and what what their intent was. So that doesn't that make also make him a murderer to his, by his own definition? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, they both are. Yes. You know, and they both have some parts of their behavior that's justified and some parts that aren't. Yeah. And like neither one of them is fully wrong and neither one of them is fully right. And that's the grace of Deep Space Nine, which is so great. So he explains that he's going to kill Kira, but take the take out her baby and raise it as his own, so as not to uh, kill the innocent. He puts the grabs... in the basket. <laughs> yes. He grabs a laser scalpel and gets ready to cut her open. Then she uses his empathy to trick him by asking for a sedative giving her a chance to fight him off and kill him. And that's what saves her life and gets him killed is his empathy. Another thing, another bold choice they make that I love, dude. They could have easily had Odo come and rescue her, right? Deus Machia, yeah. Des Deus Odo. But by not doing that, they do two things, right? I think the choice to have her kill this guy is using his empathy, as you said, is just such a baller choice from a writing perspective. And also, it reaffirms that she was able to do the investigation faster and better than Odo could in times to come and rescue her. I thought it was great. Yeah, and, Kod and Kira has to kill him. I mean, like, in, to put it in wrestling terms, you gotta keep her strong. Yeah, yeah. Right? And and I think it's essential that she did. But it's such an interesting wrinkle. She that never is... concedes, in my opinion. Never. never. In fact, she doubles down. down. Her all. line at the end is is pretty much is pretty defiant when we get there yeah yeah so uh anyway the defiant shows up for the rescue they find a despondent kira um and we find out that the roots that she was taking counteracted the sedative that she did get now the one wormhole i have and i get roots like sure whatever it countered it out is how did she know that that was yeah. gonna work yeah um but it might have just been a desperate ploy and she tried you know and like she knew she had a split second and like even when you're getting a sedative like going in for surgery like you're gonna get knocked out real fast but you might have a split second where you have some uh -huh. level of agency and if you're desperate enough he's literally got a knife to your throat you might as well take a try uh 
I don't know. A little unclear. That would be my only wormhole. That's but. that's. I think that's a legit wormhole. Uh, well, she was buying time, right? So she was I buying guess. time. If her intent was I mean, to buy time, not to get him. You know what I mean? It was pretty desperate to do anything at that point because the yeah. knife was literally to her throat. So they ask why he gave her a sedative. And here's what she says. And this is the last line in the show. He wanted to protect the innocent and separate the darkness from the light. But I don't think he realized that light only shines in the dark. And sometimes innocence is just an excuse for the guilty. Now, it's a line I, I, I have been thinking about for a couple of days, trying to, like, pull it apart. Because it, it, it sort of lands for me, but doesn't fully land. Maybe you can help me. Well, yeah, because together. I don't... Even as a justification... I think she, I mean, I, I I think she's trying to convince herself that he was totally without merit. That what he had to say is totally without merit, right? Yeah. But I don't know that she's successful in that. I don't know that I can extrapolate that from what she said. Because I think it's almost, it almost condemns her. Well, it applies to both of them. Yeah. Right? Like, light only shines in the dark, right? And sometimes innocence is just the, an excuse for the guilty. I think it applies to both of them. I think they are both innocent and both guilty, and they both have, both did sort of indefensible things and also had understandable justifications for it. And it's, and like she... For an episode this rife, right, with complexity, I would have even liked something a little more nihilistic, like a line that's like, what he didn't understand is that sometimes in the darkness, there's only darkness or something. You know what yeah. I mean? like, something a little more dour. That's right. You know, some Door there, or dour? There, there's there's some there's some darkness that light can't penetrate. Yeah, something like that. I think is what I would say. But um hey, but once again baller that she didn't she does not she does not equivocate and she does nope. not concede. There's there is no she expresses no regret for what she did in this moment. You know, she has in the past. You know, she's wrestling like I I think Part of Kira's whole journey is the wrestling with this. And like sometimes she's defensive about it, sometimes she accepts it, sometimes she doesn't. And and I think when you deal with that type of a trauma, because again, she was a not only like a soldier in an occupation, she was a child soldier yeah. in an occupation. And like heartbreakingly, that's a real thing in this world, and a real thing happening right this very minute. And and I would can't imagine the psychological difficulties that they go through. Um, so, yeah, before we move on, Keith, I want to take an opportunity, yeah. um, if I can. Let me see if it worked. It did. Okay, hold on. I have it here. So I think this is a great opportunity to revisit. Do I have it? Oh, man, I think it's the wrong episode. Know. What was the I'm episode sure. where I was like, you know, she came at Odo too hard. Oh, oh yes, at, at the, I think things passed. Was it? Okay. Where, well. where she, uh, where we found out that Odo, authoritarian Odo. Mm -hmm. I think it was things passed. Okay, so let me then pull up your notes from that, because I imagine you saved the quote from the end where she comes at oh. him. Oh, oh, that's true. Yeah, let me. I got oh, it. Oh, actually, you know what? I can just pull up the script. No, I got uh, it. I got it right you here. You got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Kira says, when I finished reading, because what I want to know is that, well, let's read it first. When I finished reading your report, I didn't know what to think. So I said to myself, that's okay, Narice. Maybe you're just stunned. You need to let this sink in. But it's been two days, Odo, and I still don't know what to think. Maybe nothing. Maybe a lot. I believed in you. A lot of people did. You were special. The one man, blah, blah, blah. Now I'm just, uh, blah, blah. Okay, the prophets know I'm not perfect. And I guess the truth is that anyone who lived through the occupation had to get a little dirty. But I need to know that no other innocent people died on your watch, Odo. Uh. That this was the only time. Now, this is what rubbed me the wrong way, right? And here we're seeing that here, in fact, she justifies killing innocent people. Quote unquote, she, well, innocent. she doesn't consider them innocent. Yes. Yes. And I think that because they don't have her acquiesce at all, Though I don't agree with her when she came at Odo, I can see why she felt righteous in that moment. And it's interesting yeah. because I think it is a it is not a flattering color on Kira, and that's no. okay. I like my characters to be complex. 
No, Just like well, it's not a flattering color on Odo, but now we have to live right, with Odo in that context. Right. These these are not deities. They're people, and they're people who have gone through lifelong trauma. But so she rec- she sees his passive acceptance of what was taking place under him and not saying not speaking up and doing anything as a a, a being guilty of inaction inaction murder of, the, of innocence through inaction right. where she justifies her murder of innocence or people uh, bo- as as collateral damage because she was in pursuit of justice which is in- right. really interesting I, I, but that's the human experience yes, right? we might isn't as well it? go into our thing because it's like the collateral damage is a part of peace <laughs> right i mean yep. I, we we will we will for the rest of human history debate what we did to end world war 2 right yeah well i mean if you want to be honest there's not much of a debate but there's n- n- well i mean but it's like but it, yes if if you were to concede that that's what ended it right which is a tough causation but yeah look and and i'm and i'm i'm not even exclusively speaking about you know the the bombs in japan mm-hmm. Like yep. firebombing most of of Germany off the map, mm-hmm. hundreds of thousands of people, innocent or innocent. Well, are they innocent, right? I mean, like, I, I, and that's it's it's so, like the atrocities that were were they necessary? Okay, to so end other atrocities. Let me like, just argue the counterpoint, right? Let me let me argue the counterpoint. Why in video games, right? There's an, often a so there's this kind of a a a. a What's the word I'm looking for? A, a thing, a trope in video games where, uh, well, you know what? Just make the bad guys Nazis. That way, you can just go in and you blow them, blow them away right, because you're Nazis guiltless. are bad. They're, yeah, the Nazis, they're robots, they're whatever. But you know, like think about in Germany at that time, there were plenty of not Nazis, right? And sure. they got they got blowed up too. Now, it'd be easy to say, well, hey, if you were able to sit back and watch your government just indiscriminately commit genocide then yeah right. you're guilty you deserve it too and right there's and also what do you expect me to do grab a pitchfork and go you yep. know like and it's it's this is messy. why i just and i think it's why religion can be tricky because religion often anoints you with what with black and whites right tells right. you what good and bad good and evil is and does not account for nuance right and also forgives you in d- it, there are also other religions that just say okay unilaterally if you choose our religion you're forgiven for all the stuff right that's you right have, doesn't matter what you do yeah so when you look at it through the lens of just like human empathy right i would assume you feel very much the way i do which is right like i don't know man i i, I yeah. can't tell you i also can't imagine being 15 and someone giving me a gun and being like bad 13. guy go yeah. 13. I, I, another example I bring up. Keith and I have this experience together, and we are not victims in this scenario, right? I I, I, I want to make that very clear. We are very privileged, privileged universities, but we've seen some things. We were on tour together. We were down, oh God, I can't remember where we were, per se, but the Fred Phelps, the evil oh, people were yeah, right, yeah, protesting the, the Westboro Baptist our Church. play because there were assumed homosexuals in our cast. They were right. Yes, it <laughs> turns out, turns out. and <laughs> Shocking. And, you know, it wasn't the homophobia, it wasn't the vitriol they were spilling that was even remotely affecting to me. You know what it was? I'm sure Keith knows. It was the eight-year-old kids. It was the five-year-old yeah. kids holding these signs and saying this stuff. Not because they believed any of it, but because they were told what to say. And well, I, I mean, there's... Well, it's it's the same thing as, like, those, you know, photographs of toddlers in clan outfits. It just... Oh, God. It just, like, like, I have such a visceral... Yeah. Sadness to that. And I guess if I'm going to spin it around back to like television, right? I say this to Jen all the time. You know, sometimes I'll be watching like a war documentary or something where animals get hurt or, you know, like things that are uncomfortable. Uh, And she's just like, I don't want to watch, I don't want to see this. And I was like, if we don't bear witness, right? At time, and not always, right? Like that's why for me, 9/11, I go, I go through it, man. Every year, I watch the docs, mm. I go through it again. I really, and I'm not saying I'm not telling you how to do you, but yeah. 
there is something about our ability now and the now and, and the here and now to avoid it at altogether. Yeah. Like you can choose your media, you can choose your whatever, but if you don't bear witness, it's tough. <laughs> like you have to bear witness is what I'm saying. And yeah. unfortunately, the reason it's uncomfortable is because the good guys don't always win. And, and, and worse yet, very often, if not always, it's almost impossible to discern who the good guys are. And or, often or, you've been you learn you realize that my whole life I've been told who the good guys are, and you know right. what? Maybe I was told wrong. Yeah. Oh my God. What we're taught as children, especially in this country, well, and 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 I think the reality is, our adult life is going to be adjudicating who is more right and more wrong because nobody is fully right, nobody is fully wrong, nobody is fully good, nobody's fully bad. It's just like calling balls and strike is it's you know who's who's 60 40 good mm -hmm. versus 60 40 bad with and allowing yourself the same gray areas because i can very well say here's what i think i would do in that scenario here's what i think is right in that scenario yeah. however placed in said scenario i'm i am failable enough to recognize that i might choose differently i might yeah. be too cowardly to choose correctly like all of those things can be right can, right or can well, and, exist and god oh, man not to get like too grim about it, but like we're kind of heading into a time where we're gonna be making those choices. We're gonna be those choices are gonna be more forced to heading us. into and a time. Well, yes, that. No, but also, I mean, like, like it can it can spiral worse. But but also, it, it it's the same thing. It's it's the you're on the subway. You see somebody being attacked. What do you do? Yeah. Does that change if that person has a knife? You know, like the we are this, in this huge privileged position to be just sitting here watching on TV what's happening over in Ukraine and Russia, in Is yeah. Israel and Palestine, all of those yeah. conflicts, and yeah. these echo chambers who will just to the to just say, hey, these are the good guys. Oh, hey, these are the evil bad guys. Oh, hey, they're killing like. Like it's like it's nothing. Like it's just a a binary poll on Twitter because that's what it is for so many well, people. It, and it becomes a political chip mm -hmm. to be played. It becomes a it becomes a whatever. Which is <laughs> why, in the face of that, right, it is so wonderful for yeah. seventeen year old Keith and Mike and people for television some television show to have the nuts to be like, hey, it ain't always black and white. Hey, yeah. it ain't all the good guy. You're not always going to walk away and say, "Hey, my hero did the right thing," or "I, I actually, I what what Kira says resonates with me." Maybe it doesn't, and maybe that's okay. Well, and 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 beyond that, it's not just that our hero sometimes does the wrong thing. Sometimes we don't know what the wrong thing is. Yeah, and so I like, just love, you know. Often I think Trek, at, at Deep Space Nine, even. Gets gets ninety eight percent there, and then the last two percent of the episode, they're like, "Nah, TV. People are watching." They flip the script at the end, and they give you yep. like a nice written thing. You burn it, yeah. I don't think they do it here, and I think the episode is stronger for it. Yeah. And I love, I love. As I get older, I don't know that I would at seventeen. I can't can't put myself back in time, but I love when we don't go black and white. I love the grays. I love being uncomfortable. I love wrestling with how I feel about something. I don't know that I love Kira in this episode. I love Nana. I think yeah. her, I think her yeah. performance is incredible, incredible. I which, love which we should say uh, just very quickly. So we did we did the wormholes. Best moment, Nana's monologue, oh, yeah. obviously. One hundred percent. Sorry, continue. We're well, we're in stem bolts now. I love the bait and switch of bringing the two guest stars that we've met before, so we know they have weight. We they have established relationship, and they kill them instantly. I, this is one of the sm I'm listen we've dealt with the founders we've dealt with the Borg we've dealt with the 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 the, the evil lizards on the other what are they called the Gorn and the other show like I've seen some bad guys this bad guy scared me more than most up until we meet him which I think like the one misstep is like eh, I would have loved for him to just have monologued like without the Vincent Price the speech weird because it, yeah. it neutered it a little bit for me but that's like a minor 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 thing um also, like, would have not hated if we had met this guy before. Like, if he had had a little more, he wasn't just a freak of the week type bad guy, but whatever. <clears throat> yeah. So minor. I really think this is a good episode, man. Really strong. Really dug it. It made me feel things. 
and that is TV, baby. That's the best of TV. So I'm going to say yeah. 94 self-sealing stem bolts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is such an interesting episode because... Is it interesting, Keith? I think so. I think it's interesting. Interesting, I might say. Uh, I don't, when I think through Deep Space Nine, remember this episode very often. Mm. And I don't quite know why. I don't know why I don't remember it. It's, I've ha at times on my watch along, come across it, be like, have I seen this episode before? I don't even remember if I've seen this one. And yet, as we talk about this, as we go through all this, like, it's great. Mm -hmm. It's a great episode, and it's and it's important. And I and I think perhaps one of the my my therapist would say perhaps I'm not remembering it because it makes me a little sad, and it it muddies up Kira in the same way that things past muddied up Odo. And I love these characters so much; it it breaks my heart a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's part of maybe why I don't remember it as well as I should. Uh, but I think, I think Nana's performance in here is is terrific. It feels a little compressed, like I said. I wish there were another ten mi minutes to sort of fully flesh out these these ideas um, and to work through all of this. Um, I get why it isn't. So uh, I'm not going to like. It's not their fault. They only got forty two and a half minutes to do it. Um, so I think it's. Fascinating. I'm gonna. I, I avoided saying interesting again. I think it's a fascinating episode. I think it's a good episode. Um, you know, I don't think it's one of those like cornerstone episodes of the series, but I think it's very, very good. So for me, it gets 90 self sealing stem bolts. Here's what's gonna blow your mind, Mike. Out of 173 episodes of Deep Space Nine, what do you think? Where do you think IMDb puts this? How many again? 173. It's got to be in the top 50, top 40. It is number 136 out of 173. It gets a 6.9 on IMDb. Huh. And I'm curious why that is. I mean, I don't I wouldn't put it in the top 50. But I would put it higher, a lot higher than 136. So, Anyway, uh, folks out there, please tell us what you think of this episode, because uh, I'm 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 so curious what everybody how everybody else experiences this episode. Maybe maybe give a rating for how you felt in '97 versus how you feel in 2024. Mm -hmm. I'd be curious if it was different or not. This is one of those episodes. Like it would be, I would prefer if we don't devolve into getting specific about your feelings on various conflicts around the world. I don't I don't know that this necessitates a political conversation or like a geopolitical conversation, but I mean if that's where you're at, just be courteous. Well, always. But yeah. we have an incredibly courteous audience. I know. I'm just We have, we have a bunch of kind and thoughtful people uh, in our audience and and I'm very grateful for that. So next week we will be talking about the begotten. So uh that will be fun. I can't wait. Thank you all for watching. Uh, if you have been, are enjoying this nonsense and want more and you haven't already, join our Patreon at patreon.com slash K and M. Spell out that and. If you're listening to the audio version of this in your podcast ears, and I know some of you are, uh, you can do us a huge favor by leaving a rating and review uh, in Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen it to. Um, that would... That, you would be shocked at how big of a difference that mm -hmm. makes in the audience that we get of people listening to this. Um, so uh, please do that if you haven't already. And I know you haven't because no one's left a review yet. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, it, it, a, a paragraph review. People have left stars. So we thank you for that. Anyway, uh, we will see you back next week with The Begotten. Uh, everybody stay cool out there. Hope it goes okay tomorrow night. We will see you later. Till then, this has been Keith and Mike. Watch Deep Space Nine. Thank you for watching KM Entertainment. If you enjoyed our particular brand of nonsense, please like and subscribe. Or become one of our patrons 
at patreon.com slash knm. It does not know what the cold open would... will fuck, try it again. Warshaw yep. gonna do cock, too. There it is. <laughs>